to go out there and to win medals and be the best in the world, you have to be 100% motivated and focused on achieving that. Otherwise, you can be in the best shape of your life. You, if your motivation is not there, there's no way you're going to achieve it. Hello and welcome back to our 40 Minute Mentor replay series. People always say that you should never meet your heroes, but having had Dame Jessica Ennis Hill on the podcast, I can safely say that she exceeded all of my expectations. Jess is a true legend and inspiration. When she won gold at the 2012 London Olympics on a night that is known as Super Saturday, she became a national treasure. Jess is such an inspiration to me and so many others. But what makes her really special is that despite all of her success and fame, she is still so down to earth. In this episode, Jess looks back on her sporting career. She shares what it took to become one of Britain's most decorated Olympians and what ultimately inspired her to jump into the founder hot seat and build the femtech startup Genis. I personally can't wait to listen back to this episode again and hope you will find it as inspiring and thought-provoking as I did. Jess, welcome to 40 Minute Mentor. How are you today? I'm really good, thank you. Nice to be here. Fantastic. Well, it's awesome to have you. Um, We always like to start our episodes with a quick fire round of questions. So please, can you finish these sentences after me? Number one, when I was younger, I always wanted to be an athlete, but I also wanted to be a journalist and a chef as well. Very well. Oh, wow. Look (laughs) at that. A proper multi hyphenate. How are your cooking skills now? I'd say they were quite good. Yeah, I enjoy cooking. So it's something I definitely couldn't be like a Michelin star chef, but I I do enjoy cooking. Oh, good stuff. My first job was? I was a waitress. Classic. Absolute classic. Yeah, I was a terrible waiter. I think I've said this on the podcast before, but I would be the person that would pour champagne on you know very rich people's hands and just like drop drop things. (laughs) So uh, I'd I was very much like that. I, I was a waitress for not a very long time, but um, yeah, I had a few clumsy moments as well, so I can relate. It's something that I think everyone should do, though, just learning customer service. And uh, it's a bit of a rite of passage, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my biggest achievement in my career to date is? I would say definitely winning the Olympic gold medal in London, but I would also say winning um, the World Championship gold medal in 2015 in Beijing. That was after... I'd given birth to my son and gone through a whole like transformation and journey. So that was a real massive, massive moment for me. So probably those two moments. Such a great answer. I mean, not many people can say that, Jess. So <laughs> totally understand that. And um, yeah, I can't wait to, to, to unpack some of those uh, amazing experiences as the conversation develops. I wish I could be better at... Um, I wish I could be better at making quick decisions. I can often be really, really indecisive over mainly the small things but I'll yeah I'll take quite a long time to make decisions on small matters which is quite irritating for me and some of the people around me at times (laughs) I get that I totally do it's what's that word people say it's analysis paralysis I'm one of those people that can write an email and then like be sat staring at it for like hours because I really want to get it right (laughs) Um, we definitely we definitely share some similar traits my biggest vice is I probably say yes too much. So I, I think that I I find that I am quite a pleaser. I want to please people and I want to agree to to help in and say yes all the time. Whereas actually sometimes I, I need to step back and yeah, like focus my energy in one area, not try to to please everyone and say yes. So probably that. That's a great, a great one. Uh, again, I, 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 I am guilty of that, and I know a lot of a lot of people are. And I think it's one of those things, isn't it? You you end up spreading yourself too thin, and then you can't always give your the very best of yourself to the people that you're trying to give time to. So it's not always the, the best thing. No, thank you for being so honest on that. And finally, can you share something that we wouldn't learn from your CV? So that could be a perceived failure or a setback in your career that you've learned a lot from. But it's a tough one because I think I've I've had lots of failures throughout my career at different levels at different stages and I've I've learned massive things from all of them. I think people often assume that I've you know I've always been a great heptathlete and it's something that I've had success with from a very early age and it was definitely not the case. So when I started doing the heptathlon, I was very much 
a massive novice. I didn't really understand the event. And I had many years where I'd have a super successful first day, terrible second day. And that was kind of like a really big turning point for me in my in my early years. So those failures at those like junior level stages have kind of shaped me and taught me a lot about the athlete that I was and the athlete that I wanted to become. That's really interesting. Yeah, I guess when you when you see the you up on the podium winning gold medal, you just think that it was just a natural thing that you just, you know, you were always destined for greatness. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear. It wasn't always that way. Well, thanks, Jess. I think we're already we've got a, a, a glimpse into into the sort of personal leader that you are. But but uh, you are very well known to be one of Great Britain's most decorated athletes. So I, I want to start at the beginning. How did you get into athletics in the first place? And And did you always have that? naturally competitive personality it's interesting I think if you were to ask that question of my parents they would probably say yes I've definitely had that kind of natural competitive like part of me from a very young age because I think they saw that from from the beginning I I actually fell into athletics like accidentally really so I I went to a summer camp that they held at our local track in Sheffield it was um, Don Valley Stadium and they basically ran summer camps for two weeks during the summer. And, you know, you got to go down and, and make friends and try all the different events and, yeah, just have a real taste of athletics for the first time. And that was like my first introduction to to sport, really. And from that point, I, you know, I I loved how like active it was. I loved trying all the events. I loved being competitive and I loved the element of just trying to better yourself and, and being the best. And after that kind of first experience, I then started training once a week on a Tuesday after school. And then it soon progressed to twice a week. And before I knew it, I was kind of just, you know, increasing those training days. And what was kind of just something that I just fell into as a hobby then started to transform into, you know, a potential future and potential career. That's awesome. That's amazing. And I think as a as a parent now to a to a six year old that's really curious and, and loves trying things, there's something to be said for just throwing your children and yourself into new things and trying different sports. And it's amazing how some just really catch you and just you, you just fall in love with. And it clearly was the case with with you in athletics. You were already winning medals on a on the international stage before you were eighteen. And I'd imagine that came with a fair amount of sacrifice as a youngster. So so firstly, did you feel like you missed out as a kid in any way? And how did you deal with the pressure and the media, I guess, exposure that came with your success at a young age? Yeah, I think that to a certain extent, I I did at those years, at the, that particular time in my life, if you would have said to me, do you feel like you're making huge sacrifices and do you feel that you're missing out? I would have absolutely said yes. Because, you know, in those teenage years, you're changing so much, you're developing, there's so much happening around you from an academic point of view, from a social point of view. And I was very much trying to keep focused on my athletic journey. So I had to make, you know, the sacrifices that all teenagers hate making because they want to be the same as all their friends. They want to go out and socialize and and do everything that everyone else is doing. At that stage for me, I couldn't do that kind of thing because I very much had to train after school. And then there was competitions at the weekend. And I quite early on had to make that decision, that conscious decision of where my focus was going to be. And, you know, at that stage, you don't know if that's that focus is going to be worth it. You don't know if you're going to go on to become, you know, the athlete that you want to be or whether, you know, you pick up an injury and and things don't perhaps go the way you'd hoped. So, yeah, I definitely felt like I was making big sacrifices, but I had great people around me to kind of help me understand like the bigger picture of it. And that definitely helped that kind of transition at that age. That's so good to hear. And what advice would you have for parents that are listening to this, perhaps, of of talented athletes who want their kids to, you know, achieve their potential, but also don't want to be that pushy parent or or give them false sense of hope? Because we know that it's it's very hard to become an elite athlete and most people don't get there. So now that you're a parent uh, and having been through that experience yourself, what advice would you have for anyone listening that's, you know, maybe struggling with that? Yeah, it's really hard because I now as a parent, I see how my parents must have felt and I can, you know, understand how 
you know, how nervous you are, how much you, you know, you just want your kids to have the best start in life and the best opportunities. And in all honesty, the biggest thing that I learned through my experience and my relationship with my parents was that they were there supporting me and encouraging me and and taking me to competitions and, and to training, but they were never an overwhelming kind of force. They were always kind of in the background. So they never got involved in my training. They never really kind of pushed me too hard. I felt that it was always like I always had an option. It wasn't I had to train, I had to compete. You know, my mum would always say just, you know, if you're enjoying yourself, then continue. Uh, And I think that's something I really took from from those years. And I'll take into, you know, the way I approach introducing sport to my kids, because I think it's all about having that enjoyment, having the opportunity to try lots of different sports and then, yeah, not having the pressure too young because it is it's an intense journey through sport. And yeah, it can be quite overwhelming. And I've seen it in a number of sports with a number of different athlete, parent, coach relationships. And um, yeah, you learn a lot and it's a tough balance to strike, but a really important one. Yeah, you're so right. And I think the word enjoyment is, is key to that, isn't it? Because it's, it's too often, and I know from personal experience and, and with friends, when you're, you're quite sporty, sometimes the, the pressure can, can, can become too much and then you start to resent it a bit. And, and I'd imagine there are probably a lot of talented people out there that have walked away probably too early from, from sport or, or other passions just because maybe that balance tipped a little bit in the wrong, wrong direction. And that's always such a shame. So um, I think, like you, I, I think I'm very conscious of that with my daughter and, you know, really want her to enjoy sport because it's such a wonderful thing, isn't it? You know, whether it's team sports or individual, just it, it teaches you so much as you're growing up and some great transferable skills. Yeah, exactly. And just knowing that you don't have to push so hard at the beginning, like you, you can learn, you know, learn your craft, learn your sport, enjoy what you're doing and then give yourself opportunity to grow. You don't have to overload yourself with intense training and a you know a real clear plan at a young age because you do have time on your hands that's so true and that that really also is the case for careers as well I mean these days it's not like it used to be where you kind of have one career and and that's it nowadays people can have multiple careers and and there's this but there's still that pressure almost to kind of have your whole career mapped out in front of you so I think there's some real synergies there with with sport we're going to fast forward a bit you graduated from university decided to go go all in as a professional athlete and then you know the history uh, has shown us all the success you've had breaking multiple world records winning world championships and obviously olympic gold it would be a bit silly of me not to ask you about that incredible day super saturday uh, where you won olympic gold how did you cope with the pressure on that day where the whole country's kind of hopes were were, were sort of, you know, everyone was very much with you, but but, but uh, there was a lot of anticipation. And what were your overriding memories from that day? I think the pressure of the two days was actually, I, I, could, I could manage that almost better than the pressure of what was happening in the lead up to the games. So I think, you know, the year before, it, you know, everyone started talking about the Olympics and obviously it being in London and, you know, the build up started to happen. And I'd never, I'd never experienced an Olympic Games before. It was my first Olympic Games. So I had no idea of, to, you know, how different it was to World Championships because of its status of the Olympics and how much it kind of captured everyone's attention. And then the fact that it was at home in our country in London, that just added another layer of pressure. And I just remember feeling just, yeah, kind of a bit overwhelmed, just, you know, seeing all these ad campaigns and everyone talking about me as the, you know, the the golden girl of the, you know, hopefully the golden girl of the Olympics and the poster girl. And I was just kind of like, well, this is my first Olympics. Like, I'm not, I hope I'll win a gold medal, but I'm not sure how it's all going to unfold yet. So it was, yeah, it was a massive learning curve, but I felt so privileged and lucky to be in that position where, you know, I, I was the poster girl for the games and I had a great, you know, team around me. I had a great family support and we just kept everything very focused on what I could control and what I could do and that was my performances on the track so actually when it came to those two days of competition I was just so bubbling up ready to start and kind of you know get rid of some of that nervous energy and adrenaline that actually those two days were 
they were extremely nerve wracking, but I was just completely ready to, you know, to step out there and compete. Love it. And what, what a day. Were you able to enjoy it? I know that, 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 that it sounds like you were so focused and so ready, you know, given all the, the, the years that of work that had gone into it. But did you actually, as, as the day went on, what was the feeling like when you, when you, when you crossed the line and realised you'd won, won gold? I mean, it was the most incredible feeling um, I'd ever experienced at that point. I can't say I enjoyed the two days. I think perhaps looking back, I could pretend that I enjoyed them. But actually, in those moments, I was so, like you say, so focused and so determined to make sure that I did everything right and didn't make any mistakes and had no regrets that I was just almost felt like I was kind of holding my breath through those two days and just hoping and wishing that everything went to plan. And then the feeling of, you know, completing one event, ticking that off my list and knowing that that went well and then moving to the next one and ticking that off, that process of going through all the events. I never allowed myself to get too far ahead of of where I was until that moment of crossing the line after the 800 metres. And it was just like the most amazing feeling where I just achieved all I ever dreamt of, really. It was very, very surreal. Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And you would have definitely been forgiven for just sort of hanging up your boots then if you want to. You can't, it's very hard to uh, to beat that. But you, you, you know, you continued and, and went on to have even more success. But I know it wasn't without its challenges. Uh, I know you had a really bad injury and then you made an amazing return after giving birth to your son in 2014. So definitely kind of ups and downs in the years after. What kept you going? What motivated you during that, that difficult period? And then were there any particular learnings from that time that, that might help anyone else going through a similar challenge right now? Whether it's, you know, coming back from injury or just having a, a tough time, perhaps with their mental health? Yeah, I think I learned so much through those times. I think after the London Olympics, I definitely found myself in a stage where I had kind of almost achieved all I wanted to achieve and a little bit more. So then going back into like winter training and, you know, going back to the beginning really of of how you kind of face winter training and prepare for the following year was really, really quite challenging because I was in this feeling of, well, I've actually, you know, why why do I want to go back into all this grueling training when I've I've reached my pinnacle? So I I definitely felt some, some moments of like questioning where I was in my career and what I wanted to do. And then the year after I fell pregnant with my son and he gave me such a huge sense of motivation in a different way that I'd never imagined. You know, I'd never been through obviously pregnancy and, you know, trying to build back into training. And then I had all these new emotions of, of being a, you know, a mum for the first time and wanting him to to see what I was doing in the final stages of my career. So he gave me a huge sense of motivation to move forward and, you know, just show him what his mum could do and also prove to myself and and those around me that I could get back to, you know, the top of my sport. Yeah, I mean, and what an inspiration you are to to, to other mothers as well, because as you said earlier in, in our chat, that that gold medal at the World Championships after becoming a mother, it was probably, yeah, every bit as uh, as rewarding, if not more, because of, of what you've been through. And um, becoming a dad for me was the, the best thing that's ever happened to me. And it also had a really positive influence on JBM, my business. And I think because I was more determined to succeed and provide for my family, although I was unbelievably sleep deprived and felt very, uh, you know, like all parents and very, I felt very unprepared when Sienna came along. How would you say being a mother has changed your life, both from a sporting perspective, but also just outside of that? I mean, it, like you say, it changes you in every way possible and you can never really expect, you know, how you're going to feel or how you're going to change until, you know, your baby arrives. And I had all these like preconceptions and ideas of what it was going to be like to be a mum and to train and to have Reggie down at the track. And I just had this idea that it would all just flow really easily, and really nicely. And actually, you know, that's not the case. And babies are so unpredictable and you know I'd been driven by this kind of world where everything was planned and organized and goal orientated and then my world was like thrown up into a bit of a spin really and it changed me in the most amazing ways like more than anything it gave me like huge perspective on what was actually really important it made me appreciate what I'd achieved to that point and then how lucky I was to to be in a position where I could bring my son on this final part of my journey within 
elite sport. So yeah, I mean, it changed me physically as well. So all the physical challenges that I had of, you know, trying to regain my speed, my strength, my endurance, alongside, you know, just wanting to be the best mom I could possibly be to him was, um, yeah, it was just the most amazing time. And I'd honestly say it was the most challenging time, but the most rewarding and incredible experience I've ever had, being able to, you know, couple my my private life and my family life with my my career to that point. So yeah, it was just amazing. That's wonderful. And and you I guess you ended up deciding to retire after an incredible career as an athlete in twenty sixteen. So that that must have been a difficult decision, you know, having it, it been your, I guess, your whole career up to that point. So can you talk us through that decision making process and how you knew it was the right time to step away? Because I think it's also interesting, perhaps for others, uh, you know, who are not in sport, but people listening to this that are making big career decisions or pivoting in their careers. Yeah, it's, it's a really tough time. And like you say, whether it's within sport or business and you're, you know, you, you're in this position where you you have to make those big decisions. It, it can be really, really difficult. And there's so many different factors that contribute to that outcome. I think for me, I felt I was in a, a very fortunate position because so many times within sport, you're either forced to retire through injuries or through setbacks or not quite reaching your potential. Whereas for me, I, I didn't have any injuries at that stage that was you know potentially going to hold me back from moving forwards. And I could have perhaps continued for another year, but my overriding feeling was that my motivation had changed massively and that's what I focused on. So, you know, to go out there and to win medals and be the best in the world, you have to be 100% motivated and focused on achieving that. Otherwise, you can be in the best shape of your life. You, if your motivation's not there, there's no way you're going to achieve it. And for me, in that last year going into into the Olympics in in Rio, my motivation was starting to waver and I knew that I was coming to the time where actually I was more motivated by the kind of excitement of retirement and what was on the other side as opposed to, you know, continuing to compete and, and push myself at that level. And that ultimately was the the reason why I decided to retire. And for me it was it was the right time and it, it felt right and yeah, it just kind of happened where I, I felt that I wanted it to happen. Yeah, and, and you very much did it on your own terms. And I think that sort of organic way of retiring when you, you just realise it was the right time and I guess your priorities were were shifting is probably the best way to go and, and to go out on top. I've had the pleasure of, of interviewing other elite athletes before and coaches like Sir Clive Woodward and fellow Olympians like Kate and Helen Richardson Walsh. And we talked a bit about the, you know, the challenge and the emotion that comes with transitioning away from one career to another, especially when you've given so much to it and sacrificed a lot. So once you'd made that call, and it sounds like you were ready for it, how did you actually cope with retirement? And actually, like, I'm not going to do this again. So what was that experience like? And, and, and what advice would you have for other people that might be in that situation right now? Yeah, I mean, it was it was strange, because you're going from one phase of your life where you know, you've lived a certain way. Like for me, sport was my whole life. So it wasn't just turning up to training and competing. It was the way I ate, the way I slept, the way I recovered, like everything. And then all of a sudden that basically just stopped. And there was no training program. There was no like major goals or championships to work for. It was just kind of like, right, that phase is done. And now you've got to look to move in a new direction. And yeah, I think for a lot of people, it can be quite overwhelming because you're, you know, you're essentially having to change who you are and start a new career to a certain extent. And I think for me, again, because I was able to make, you know, that retirement decision on my own terms and I knew I wanted to, you know, have another child and I'd already had Reggie, that my my focus was on them and that phase of my life. But it was just an amazing like distraction and then it allowed me to have time to to really think about the next phase of my career and what I wanted to do yeah and I guess you were and we're going to come on to talk about Janice but I guess you were able to take that time and then be quite deliberate in in what you decided to do next um uh, and and that's so that's 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 really great just before we come on to talk about your new business what do you miss most about competing and is there a way you can replace the adrenaline that you used to get from competitions or or, or how do you kind of 
can you and how do you uh, uh, get that these days? It's quite hard. I'm not sure you can ever really replicate that kind of feeling that you have when you're, you know, ready to compete. Yeah, I kind of, I, I do miss that feeling because you you stand on the line, you know, whether it's for the hurdles or the 200 or whatever it might be, and you're you're so prepared, you know, physically, mentally, you're excited by the crowd and you're ready to go. And that adrenaline and the nerves is incredible. So I definitely miss that element. But then I also don't miss the flip side of having to get to that point because it's, you know, it's huge sacrifices. It's a lot of training. And, and those moments are really rare when you're stood on the line and you are, you know, in the best shape of your life and ready to compete. So I, I do, I, I miss those those moments, but I, I think it's hard to replicate those. And I don't think I would actually want to, um, because I feel I've, I've been there and yeah, I've had those incredible moments and I still feel that nervous energy when I watch athletes compete now, but it's, it's in a slightly different way, which is quite nice. Yeah, I was going to ask you how it feels when you watch uh, watch the Great British team at the Olympics these days. But is there is there a part of you that that kind of says, "Oh, I could still do that," or do you, are you quite happy being a an armchair armchair fan? Yeah, I'm quite happy watching. To be honest, it's um, it is really nice to see you know the team moving forwards and and you know some of the girls that I competed against within the heptathlon are still competing now. So it's it's great to see them progressing and, and moving on and moving forwards. But yeah, I think I enjoyed those years. They were fantastic, some of the best years of my life. But actually doing it again now no I don't think I could do it right now I'm, t- I'm too old now <laughs> oh you're you're not old Jess we're the we're, we were born in the same year I think so I think we're still very yeah, very so young. We're, so we're young okay yeah, good. exactly exactly <laughs> um well you we've talked about your incredible sporting career but you have then decided to venture into the world of entrepreneurship something that I, I know a bit about and um I think it was after the birth of, of Reggie that, that inspired you to create Jenna, so can you can you tell our listeners a bit about that that part of the journey and how Jenna's came into fruition? Yeah, so after I had Reggie in, in 2014, I came back to competing and I, I had an amazing team around me who basically educated me, educated themselves on how my body had changed physically and what I needed to do, the process that I needed to follow to get back to, you know, the top of my sport. And obviously it, it went very well and I won the the world championships the following year in Beijing and then a silver medal in Rio the year after so I had the most incredible experience of, of coming back after childbirth with the support of great people around me and then when I retired and had my daughter it made me realize that gosh what a privileged position I was in firstly just to have those people who could help me you know, understand my body from a physiological perspective and really know the right things to do and when. Um, I had so many friends who kind of, you know, was going through similar situations as starting their family, but not knowing how to move their body and when to move it and what was safe and, and et cetera, et cetera. And it really just led me to think I'd love to create a space or a platform where I could help to educate women and women can educate other women on their experiences of, you know, how your body as a woman changes through these phases of your life, hormonally and prenatally and postnatally. So yeah, that led to the creation of Genis. And we've since pivoted and changed, you know, certain elements of it. And we are very much focusing on cycle mapping at the moment, which is really understanding how your body changes through your, your menstrual cycle and those four phases of your menstrual cycle and, you know, how to move and, just how to be in tune with your body and know how to to work out and exercise for you as an individual as opposed to you know mass fitness trends and and everything else that's out there amazing and uh, no i've had the the great pleasure of uh, of working with you and the genesis team recently and uh, i'm very excited about you know where the business is going can you tell our listeners just uh, who i'm sure many are going to be checking out the app straight after listening to this so what what can they expect from it and what is your your big mission for the business yeah, I think our big mission is to help educate more as many women as possible to understand their body. So body literacy, really in tune, you know, become really in tune with how their body changes hormonally. Because I think the more we've delved into this area is that bigger realization that so much out there and around how we move as individuals is created around a male 
physiological kind of makeup and not females. And that's something that's really important. You know, we want to help as many women just understand them as individuals and that's our biggest mission and yeah and once you get into the app you know you go on for an onboarding system you can tell us you know how you interpret your cycle and then we will create a program that's bespoke to you to help you know when to train at the right times of your your cycle so in your follicular stage it's better to you know, train and, and load yourself with weights and, and strength training. So you have a bigger physiological advantage in that phase. And then in your luteal phase, it's more of an advantage to, to do steady state sessions and, and not push yourself for those big hit sessions. So it's all these really amazing like bits of information that should be made like really accessible to women so that they can, yeah, make the most of, of how they train. That's really, really fascinating. And you've alluded to it there. And, and I know you've talked before about the gender data gap within sports science. I think I've read that only 6% of studies involve women, which is, is pretty unbelievable to be honest with you. So Genis will, will work towards closing that gap, but, but what else do you think needs to happen to put more of a focus on women's health? Yeah, I think it's great that so many people are now talking about the world of femtech and just highlighting this area as an area that's not been highlighted in the past. I think that we need so much more research done in this area. I think we work very closely with our physiologist, Dr. Emma Ross, and she's incredible, like pioneer in this area. But, you know, she speaks so highly about how we need to have more funding to allow more women and more companies to, you know, invest in doing more research and product and um, projects where we look into, you know, those different elements of of a woman's makeup. So yeah, I think, yeah, awareness, highlighting the area and then funding is a huge part of being able to close that gender data gap for sure. Definitely. And, and I've definitely seen more, like more candidates of ours that, that work in the tech space, like proactively going after or wanting to work in femtech. And we're seeing more investment sort of flow into that category. So hopefully there's, this is just the beginning and uh, yeah, there'll be, be a, a lot more companies sort of tackling this 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 area how have you found the transition from professional athlete to being a tech founder because it's not a, not an easy thing to do what were the skills and characteristics from your you know previous career that you most rely on uh, in in this new part of your career yeah it's been so interesting and it's been really kind of that kind of phase where I've I've lived my life in a certain way for such a long time and now I'm pushing myself out of my comfort zone into a completely different area like the business world which is it has some similarities but a lot of differences as well and I think more than anything the you know the things that I've learned within sport the importance of of team and, and those people around you and you know, having that focus, that discipline and, and structuring what you do and and also that awareness of, you know, you are going to face some setbacks and failures, but, you know, ultimately that's part of the journey and it's knowing when, you know, to kind of learn from those mistakes and move on in a different direction or when to keep, you know, pushing in an area that you feel strongly about. So, yeah, I mean, I've I've learned so much already in the past two, three years. And it's been great to be able to bring some of my learnings from the sporting world into into the business world. So they've actually complemented each other really well. And yeah, it's just been really exciting to to kind of move into a, a completely new field. That's great to hear. And and I've seen a lot of very successful athletes make really really great transitions into business because you know as you said there's there's lots of really really transferable skills and qualities that just really work particularly in the startup world actually where it is a, there's a lot of ambiguity and setbacks as you said one of the things that I think I could I can see being hugely attractive is is just those learnings that you bring to a business and I can see a lot of candidates wanting to work with someone like yourself so how would you describe the culture at Genis and when you're hiring uh, because I'd imagine off the back of this you'll get lots more applications what do you look for in hires yeah I think it's a really good question I think as an athlete my kind of core values have always been something that I've really kind of stuck by and stayed true to so that's that kind of you know being who you are as an individual being honest creating that environment where you have those individuals that are hugely passionate about what they do but collectively come together in a really powerful way and I think everything that 
I want to create at Genis and the team wants to create is kind of replicating that almost the team and the environment that I've had within the sporting world. You know, those great, amazing, passionate people who come and make huge sacrifices to deliver on a collective goal that is going to make such a, a huge change to so many women's lives. So I, I, you know, very much want to create an environment where everyone feels the kind of balance with life. So the ability to to bring what they need to from a work sense, but also, you know, everything else that happens in everyone's lives is still valued as well. But there's so many different qualities like we, we look for within team members. And I think always having those core, you know, values that you have as an individual and being able to bring them out into your work environment is is something that is probably the most important thing yeah. I see in people. No, that's great. And I think for for a company like yours at the early stage of of, of the journey, but that really stands for something that's it's, it's really important that it's, that's that's kind of being very disruptive uh, in an area that you're so passionate about. I think you really need that mission alignment, that purpose, and I think that's something that really shines through with some of the best companies we work with. They're they're just able to they're talent magnets, but then it's also they're hiring people that just really buy into it, and they're going to be great like ambassadors and advocates for the brand. And I can definitely see that at, at Genis. Another part of, I mean, hiring and culture, and, and that's one of the most important parts of startup life and, and one of the hardest bits, but one of the best bits when you get it right. Another bit is funding and uh, fundraising, which um, is a hard graft. Uh, and you raised uh, a million pre-seed funding, which is, is incredible for a first time founder. So how did you find the that whole fundraising cycle, the pitching process, given you'd never done it before? And are, are there any other aspects of startup life that you found really challenging? Yeah, I think that's such an interesting like part of it. And I think it was a massive learning curve for myself as founder and Jane co-founder. And myself, Jane, and our CEO, you know, we we kind of went through lots of, as you know, lots of conversations, um, lots of meetings and lots of moments where you feel that things are going really positive and then it dips a bit and then you're back up again. So it's, it's a massive emotional roller coaster. Again, something that I've experienced before in sport, but you're slightly out of your comfort zone. And it was, it was really interesting speaking to lots of, lots of different investors and a lot of male investors as well to try and explain firstly who we are, what we're about, what we're trying to achieve. And also there was that added level of trying to explain like the value of what we're trying to do and how much value it brings to so many women, because, you know, this is still an area that is not hugely researched. There's not loads of data out there saying this and and that and, and the funding's not necessarily there. So it was quite, quite challenging at times to kind of convince certain people as the importance of you know, 50% of the population are women. And, you know, we're kind of, you know, we have all these hormones that are changing and all these major life phases that we go through that actually does require, you know, a lot of attention and, and time. I mean, it's something that's hugely valued and important. So yeah, it was definitely very interesting, but we had some great conversations and we now have some great investors and yeah, we're able to to continue building what we're building and you know, evolving what we're doing as well, which is super exciting. Amazing. Yeah, I think sometimes you really need people to look at the future. I mean, it's such a huge opportunity, this, but when it's a, a relatively un, well, untapped uh, area of, of technology and um, it, it, it might be a bit daunting for the more conservative investors out there. So um, it's great that you've, you've found some fantastic VCs and I'm sure as the business evolves, there's going to be a lot more interest in getting involved. So well done on that. I know it's not it's not always the most fun uh, going to market to raise funding, but um, definitely a great learning. I think every time you do it, you get that much more kind of confident with it, don't you? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Well, um, we're, we're getting towards the end of the conversation, Jess, but there's a, I really wanted to touch on, on mentorship because this is the 40-minute mentor, unsurprisingly. Um, and I know you've done a, a lot of mentoring yourself, including I read for the... English rugby team. So can you tell our listeners a bit more about how you got involved with that um, initiative and what does mentorship mean to you personally? Yeah, it was um, it was a great day to, you know, went down to Brighton for the day and met all the England rugby team and their support staff. So, you know, their strength conditioning coaches, the nutritionists, their psychologists and had a really great session just kind of, you know, 
yeah, sharing my experience of elite sport and what it took for me to get to the the heights that I did, the sacrifices that I made and some of the challenges that I faced along the way. And then we had just a very like open forum of all the players asking lots of different questions, which was just, it was just brilliant. There were some great questions and it's just really amazing to be able to share experiences from, although your sports are very different, there's lots of common ground, things that can be learned. Um, and then I had some great conversations with the uh, support staff as well, which was really insightful. And I think mentoring and those conversations within you know, business or sport or crossing over into different areas is really, really important. I think you learn so much and you you get to ask yourself questions that you might not have asked yourself before. So the value of of mentoring and, and having those conversations with individuals or, or with a team is is huge, I think. Mm, yeah, it's so true. And I think it, 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 we talked a bit about on the podcast, the importance of being a mentor, but also being a mentee. And I think all of us can do both roles. You know, everyone has got something valuable that others can learn from. And I think um, you can learn a lot from from mentors, but you can also learn a lot about yourself by having mentees yourself and, and being a mentor. So I think it's a really, it's a really good two-way initiative, um, which is a bit of a win-win. I know another topic that we're, we're both passionate about is diversity and inclusion. And you've backed a, an awesome initiative called Union Black which is Britain's Black Cultures and Steps Towards Anti-Racism, a, a free online education program for university communities across the UK. So can you tell us a bit about that initiative and what else do you think uh, needs to happen to make opportunities more accessible to underrepresented communities? Yeah, I've worked with Santander for a number of years and when they started speaking to me about this project and what they were hoping to enrol in into the open universities, I, I just thought it was fantastic. I think you know, the huge problem that we have with racism and not having diversity and what we do is around education. It's, you know, having those kind of unbiased conversations where we delve deeper into our thought processes as individuals and and educate ourselves in a way that we perhaps thought we were educated, but actually we're not. And I think it's such a fantastic way to be able to, you know, put that as a package, as a course into a university environment and try and help create that change at that level. So I think it's fantastic. And I'm yeah really proud to support it. Oh, great. No, it's, it's so good to see those sorts of initiatives happening. And I think we're, we're also seeing some really positive progress in the tech industry as well and the venture world. Uh, still lots of work to be done, but it's great to see these sorts of things uh, being taken seriously. Again, I, I feel like we should, we've got to touch upon your damehood, Jess. We, we've never had, I, I feel like I should have called you Dame Jess, actually, uh, throughout this conversation. <laughs> but um, um, no. it's, it's a, a richly deserved recognition of all your success and hard work. A lot of people with lots of success have big egos and yeah, are, are not always the most approachable. And, and I can say, wholeheartedly from working with you you're the total opposite of that you're so down to earth and 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 so so friendly and 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 great to chat to so I want to ask you how do you handle the adulation that comes with being so successful um the pressure that comes with being a role model especially to to young people because I I get the sense that your natural personality is is not to be the kind of the show off but you have all this thrust upon you so how, how have you coped with that? Uh, I, I think it's it's definitely strange. I think when I get asked the question of like, how does it feel to be a, a role model? It still makes me feel slightly uncomfortable because I think I, I've I just entered a sport, which I loved. I've, I've worked hard. I've, you know, I had some great success and I'm just, I'm just doing what I do and just being myself. And I think it's, it's incredible like the you know young girls or young boys and individuals look to to what I've achieved and and see me as a role model it's such a huge honor but I don't really see myself in that light it's a really strange feeling and I think more than anything with with everything that's come in my career I've been surrounded by great people and you know great family great team and and those individuals that are around me have you know, allowed me to just continue being myself and not allowed me to get carried away with anything. And, you know, the damehood was such a huge honour. And I remember, you know, having the letter, I think I actually had a call about it. And I was like, I honestly couldn't believe it. I, I thought that someone was ringing me up to to do a bit of a prank. And, 
you know, it was just so strange. And to have that day, you know, in the palace with my husband and my mum and my grandparents, it was, you know, to cast my mind back to where I started as a, you know, as a young nine-year-old, never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that I'd be in Buckingham Palace receiving a damehood, having achieved what I'd achieved to that point. It was just, yeah, it, absolutely incredible. And I think the thing that allows me to just like stay true to who I am is just never, you know, going back to those values, never forgetting those values that are important to me that are core to who I am and and just being being myself and being honest, I think is is the biggest thing that I've tried to do throughout the years. Oh, that's that's so great. And such a it's it's a great mantra to live by, I think, sort of staying grounded and being you're not changing despite the success you have it's it's easier said than done but something that you've done amazingly well and I think that's that's super inspiring we've obviously talked a lot about the successes we talked about some of the challenges but do you have any regrets when you look back at your career and or are there things you 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 know you wish you'd have done that you didn't get a chance to or or any particular things that are still on the the bucket list to tick off in the years ahead from a personal perspective I suppose there's still things that I want to achieve moving forward. There's lots of aspirations that I have with, you know, with Janice and, and the world that I'm in now. But I think if I cast my mind back to, you know, my sporting career, I actually, I have no regrets and I, I don't think you should have regrets. I think that, you know, I, I've had plenty of failings and things that at the time I've I've thought, gosh, you know, why has this happened? This is the most awful thing to have happened. Why me? Whether that be through injuries or you know, performances that just weren't very good. But actually, you know, you need all those moments. And in the moment of those disappointments and failures, it feels like your world's crumbling. But, you know, give it a few months, a year, two years down the line, you cast your mind back to those times. You know, you learn so much from them. And I feel that they're all a part in shaping your journey to where you ultimately end up. So, yeah, for me, I I don't think... I, I definitely don't have any regrets. I wouldn't have changed the path of, of anything that happened within my career. Oh, amazing. Thank you, Jess. Well, uh, I could talk to you for hours, but we're sadly at our wrap-up questions. So in one sentence, what do you think the future holds for Janice? Oh, these are so hard when it's one sentence. <laughs> I hope for Janice that we can have a positive, a huge positive contribution on changing as many women's uh, lives as possible. I think that's a great one. And I'm sure you will. At the end of your career, and I guess this is your second career, what would you like to be remembered for? I always said in my sporting career, I just want to be remembered for my sporting achievements and, you know, hopefully being one of the greatest athletes. I think in this next career that I have, again, I just want to be, you know, for myself and the team to be remembered for having a real positive impact on on changing the way women live their lives. Love that. And I've just realised that that question, you've actually achieved that first part, which is incredible. I guess not many people that have come on this podcast, they're still kind of going on that journey. And it's it's just amazing to talk to someone that has, you know, is one of the greatest athletes. So, uh, yeah, amazing. And we talked a bit about um, mentorship, Jess, already. But if you could be mentored by any person dead or alive, who would that be and why? This is such a hard question. I think that... Yeah, I think that you have, for me, I've had different mentors in my life at different stages that have brought such great value. And I've spent a lot of time with a sports psychologist that I've used throughout my career, Pete Lindsay. And those kind of mentoring conversations that I had with him through various stages have been so insightful and so, so valuable in respect to, you know, the transition of, you know, becoming a mother and going back to competing and all those conversations and questions I had he was just a massive sounding board for me and a great mentor so I think you do have different mentors at different stages I think if I was to have if I could have any it's really hard I um, I think (laughs) I suppose I always look to to sporting great so I I remember watching The Last Dance with Michael Jordan I don't know if you saw a documentary a while ago it was just incredible and I really I'd obviously, you know, known how amazing he was in his career, Michael Jordan, but actually to delve into his personality and the way he motivated himself like day to day was just incredible to see his like whole mindset and mentality. I think to have a conversation with him would be incredible, like to offer some, you know, 
nuggets of advice and, and mentorship would be yeah pretty inspiring yeah oh I, I completely agree with that so Michael if you're listening uh give us a shout Jess would love yeah, to be give mentored me a call. By <laughs> but I, I also think about the that documentary that's also just showed the the incredible coaching of that team and how how the and I forget his name but the coach that was able to manage all of those different personalities and the you know the, the, the you know just there was such it's so high profile because of Michael Jordan but and it's, it's honestly probably the most inspiring documentary I've ever seen so uh, I completely yeah. agree with that one that's, that's such a good I answer I would agree and I think I think the psychology behind the team was amazing and actually like you say for the coach to you know, it's hard enough to coach one individual and, you know, different personality traits within one person. But like you say, the whole team and the different dynamics and how they came together was just incredible to watch. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, please do check it out. It's, it really is amazing. Just finally, what's your final piece of career or life advice that you'd like to leave our listeners with? I would say, Always surround yourself with good people. I think that's been the reason why I've been able to be so successful. So make sure you have the right team. And I think always trust in the process. You know, you want to get to a certain point, but you can't like jump too far forward. You've got to take those, you know, those baby steps and those ticking off those short term goals to get to that end end goal. So, yeah, always trust in that process. Such wise words, such great mentorship. Jess, thank you so much for coming on 40 Minute Mentor. It's been a real joy to talk to you and I know it will have really inspired our listeners. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for tuning back in. I really hope you enjoyed today's 40 Minute Mental episode. And if you're after even more mentorship, then please make sure you look through our podcast archives of over 200 episodes. And if you're enjoying 40 Minute Mentor, we would love to hear why. We read every single review that you leave us. So please consider taking one minute today to head over to ratethispodcast.com forward slash 40mm or your favorite podcast platform to let us know what you're enjoying about the pod. And if you have any feedback on how we can make it even better, please reach out to our head of marketing and 40 Minute Mentor producer, Hannah, on hannah at jbmc.co.uk. We really can't wait to hear from you.